pleased to host uh, Margareta Lovell, the J.D. McAvoy Jr. Chair in the History of American Art, a graduate of Yale's American Studies program and a cultural historian by training. Margareta specializes in the material culture, art, and architecture of France, Britain, and North America. She joins us to discuss her recent book, Painting the Inhabited Landscape, Fitz H. Lang, Lane, sorry, and the Global Reach of Antebellum America. In conversation with Margareta is our colleague, David Henkin, the Margaret Bourne Professor of History and a scholar of 19th century American culture. But even phrasing it that way seems like an understatement. Um, now, before I turn things over to Margareta and David, I did want to draw your attention to um, upcoming towns and events. Next Wednesday, October 11th, uh, we, the Townsend Center and the Berkeley Center for New Media, will be hosting the first in a series of conversations on AI and the humanities. Um, Vikram Chandra, novelist and faculty in the Department of English, Hannah Zeven, me media historian and professor in our Department of History, and Timnit Gebru, the a former engineer at Google's Ethical AI and the founder of the nonprofit Black in AI. Uh, the three of them will discuss the topic of generative creativity and interpretation. Now we've been tracking registration for that event and it's oversubscribed. So the Townsend Center is gonna live stream that event and the link to the live stream is now available on the center's events webpage. Finally, our next book chat will take, take place two weeks from now on Wednesday, October 18th, um, when we will be joined by Dana Funahasi, a professor in the Department of Anthropology. Um, Dana will be here to discuss her new book, Untimely Sacrifices, Work and Death in Finland. And she will be joined by Dan Blanton, a colleague in the Department of English. So without further ado, I'll yield the floor to you, Margareta and David. So uh, this is a huge honor for me. Um, I mean, just uh, just getting a free copy of this uh, <laughs> of, of of this book is uh, you know probably increases my annual compensation uh, by a significant uh, a fraction. But also, this is uh, as those of you who haven't seen it yet, and I'm almost tempted just to, to to pass it around. This is an extraordinarily impressive book, not just because uh, as even a twenty second perusal. We'll show you. It's um, it's phenomenally um, beautiful in every single way. Uh, but uh, it, it it's also well. I don't want to say too much about it because we really want to hear from from the author. But I just uh, a personal note. Um, uh, huge uh, huge admiration for the the research, the thought, uh, uh, and and the vision, um, so to speak, that goes into this book. So uh, you know, lots of us when we uh, a colleague's book is. Uh, the first come out, we go straight to, to to the acknowledgments um, uh, and try to, to, to figure out you know who we know. Uh, but uh, uh, instead, that's not where I went. Where I, I actually often go, especially with a, an esteemed uh, colleague like Margareta, is to think about uh, how she came to this topic. Something else, else we didn't have. Uh, in, I know very little about uh, Fitzhugh Lane, or I did. Now I actually know quite a bit. Um, <laughs> But enough about Margareta that this sort of made sense as a kind of uh, uh, as a kind of painter who might uh, occupy and absorb the focus of Margareta's scholarship and curiosity. Uh, but um, I actually, as I read the book, began to wonder whether there were some deeper things other than time and place uh, and sort of, uh, visual motifs that uh, drew, drew her there. So uh, one of the things I, I learned uh, in this book. Uh, that in Fitzulane's um, lifetime, before his reputation, as she puts it, descended into a nadir of invisibility, I think that was, uh, uh, and then before it was sort of resurrected and reconstructed in all sorts of interesting ways in the 20th century, uh, was that uh, Lang was valued for a couple things, including uh, intense accuracy, so sort of a kind of conscientious, uh, intention to detail uh, and to getting things right uh, in their specificity, and also to the ability to evoke in, uh, in his viewers and his patrons um, memories of 
of place over time, to transport people uh, to a real place in a real time, uh, which then made me think, oh, well, that's 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 why you chose this 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 painter. That's sort of what you are doing for a living as an art historian is you're committed to a level of material specificity and accuracy um, uh, that might seem to go beyond what would be necessary to sustain the uh, art historical intervention. Um, but also you are trying to transport us uh, and do succeed in transporting us across time and space uh, to a particular place that we have sort of vague, imagined, maybe mythologized memories of. So I, with that sort of supposition, I did want to hear you talk about how your relationship to, to this to this painter, uh, and maybe even to what extent you identify with 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 Lane in relationship to visual culture or the New England landscape or or relationship to material life or or anything. So. Well, thank you, David, for that um, warm introduction and. Uh, I thank you for doing this. Um, I, I, I should say perhaps right off that uh, David has spent his professional life in the antebellum period. I have not. So I, I'm a, I, I had some trepidation about asking an expert to come look at that. As One a, would not know that from this book. So <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons I picked this subject is that I had worked in the 18th century. I'd worked in the late 19th, early 20th century. And I thought, I don't know a whole lot about this antebellum period, so I, I need to fill in my own ignorance there. So, um, so how did I come to this project? Um, a, a roundabout way, which I think is often the case, although I'm sure that there's some academics who are very um, systematic in picking their topics and, and making them work. I'm not. Um, I, I saw an exhibition of Lane's work a long time ago um, in, the, in the late 80s. And I remember thinking these paintings are really not only magical in themselves, but very different from the other landscape paintings that I was used to. Um, but aside from that sort of memory of, you know, these are um, some of these are really amazing uh, works of art. Um, it took a long time before I decided that I was actually going to do anything with Lane. It, 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 in fact, um, it wasn't until I was co-teaching a class with Joe McBride, who, bless his heart, is here today, um, called The American Forest, Its History, Ecology, and Representation, a partnership between Art History and uh, ESPM, um, which was a super course, a really wonderful course to, to teach and to learn from. I learned enormities from, from Joe McBride, um, where I was trying to think to myself, what what was the what's the ecological thinking of the artists who are painting the landscape in, in this period? And most of them are not, <laughs> I guess is the one way to put it. Uh, they are not understanding the extractive industries. They're not thinking about the extractive industries that were very important at this time. But Lane is, and he's unusual in that he um, is painting the, uh, the lumbering industry, the sawmills, uh, the uh, the movement of lumber on on, on, on the seas with, with these lumber schooners. Um, so it started there. I thought, okay, you know, I've done a lecture for class. This might make a nice article. So it started as a very controllable, nice little article. <laughs> and it soon got completely out of hand. Uh, um, one of the things that became clear early on was that it, uh, um, uh, is that he's a really good case. Uh, he offers a good case study for canon formation because he had a substantial local reputation during his lifetime, and then his reputation dissolved. People even forgot his name. It was, and, and, and not a single one of his paintings changed hands at auction for 70 years. Uh, um, so it was like he was gone. Um, and then for reasons having to do with American culture in the 20th century, which is another thing that interests me, he then became really uh, important to people. Uh, they saw things in his paintings that were useful for a Cold War um, moment. Um, so, so there was the canon formation question that has always interested me. Uh, um, and also because he's interested in labor. most. 19th century American painters are particularly interested in labor, and he clearly is. 
um, he was he wasn't a trained artist, so he never sat in life class and studied the human figure uh, for years, as most artists did. Um, but he's clearly wanting to deal with figures doing their work in in, in public, out, out where he can see them and portray them. So, so that was also useful. Is that it helped me um, get a handle on on ideas and attitudes uh, towards. Uh, um, uh, towards labor. And, and and last, I was really interested in the economy of art. Um, well, I was interested in, in, econ in, in the movement of money. Let me put it that way. Most art historians don't talk about money, <laughs> but for some reason it interests me. I think it interests us all. <laughs> we may be a little embarrassed about the fact that we're interested in it. Um, and so I was interested in seeing how an artist made a living because this is something that most art historians don't think about. It's just, they're, they're these products that we deal with as finished entities that we can um, approach. But the fact that they were entities that solved an economic problem for a specific person at a specific moment is, is, um, uh, is something that's, that's not often uh, looked at. So I wanted to see how he had made a living, how he had created a patronage uh, system or, or or group, how he tried to, um, uh, in fact, portray parts of this economic system that Gloucester, which is his hometown, um, was very much engaged in. So um, the fun part of the story was when it took off and went in different directions. We have China and Ireland and Suriname. Suriname and Puerto Rico, uh, which are very, very integral to uh, the economic life of this little town, well, little city. city. Let's call it a little city. Um, not quite 8,000 people. So everybody knew everybody, right? 8,000 people is not so big. Um, so that's when it got really exciting. That's when it was really fun. So I, I've given you a long answer to a short question. No, I, I, mean, I think it's helpful. I, uh, I would point out though that economy works in a couple of different ways here because there is a story about the ec an economic story about uh, the sort of resuscitation or rediscovery of, um, of late in the 20th century. And then there is, as Margaret points out, a really interesting story about uh, how his commissions fit in with other things he painted, like signboards and things like that. Um, but I think the most striking thing in this book about the economy is his representation of e economic activity, some of which relates to his own uh, practices and uh, participation in, in an art producing market, and some which doesn't, just has to do with the economic activities, extraction, or fishing trade, et cetera. So it, it, is, is, in, it is in some ways uh, a very much a story about, uh, about the economy, but the title of the book that you've chosen, The Inhabited Landscape, uh, um, emphasizes something different. So I, I, mean, I might be interesting to hear you talk about that. I mean, the first thing that will jump out at you when you see a book called Painting the Inhabited landscape is uh, the polemical insistence that this is not virgin wilderness and that uh, some of the grounds on which uh, painting from this period has been celebrated or misunderstood. And even some of the rediscovery of Lane uh, in Emersonian terms in the 20th century, which was really striking here, uh, imagines a landscape that is under inhabited, uninhabited, or, uh, or somehow at one with nature. So that's one thing. But I feel like there are a lot of other things going on here about habitation um, uh, that maybe you could talk us through, if that's OK. About habitation. Um... The claim I make is that he is he's painting an ideology. He's painting a, 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 a political economy. He's, he's painting what he understands to be particularly New England's fit with um, the land that the New Englanders occupied at that moment um, and inhabited at that moment. But he also has um, shows ingredients of what has happened in that place uh, at different times in history. So, so there's always this sort of eye cast back. Um, the Revolutionary Fort, for instance, in the middle of Gloucester Harbor is very much in the middle of many of his paintings. And a revolutionary fort on the ramparts of which he sits as he paints the town of Castine um, in, in Maine with a cannon at his at his side is very much part of, let's remember 
in the 16th century, what was going on here? In the 17th century, what was going on here? <clears throat> when the Dutch and the French and the English, and then finally the Americans are burning this town and pummeling it with cannons. And um, that's now this peaceful vacation village. Right? He, he asks us to think three-dimensionally about space. So that's a part of the inhabitants. He also asks us to think about indigenous people and their history in the place and their uh, enduring presence in this yes. period. Yes, he's, he, he, most 19th century American um, painters of the landscape will, like someone like Thomas Cole, will insert a heroic male uh, Native American figure at the top of a waterfall with a bow and arrow and feathers um, and a, a very romantic vision of something that Cole is already telling us is gone, right? But we can romantically imagine in this place. But Lane doesn't do that. He he paints his Native Americans in their um, what you might call sort of compromised clothing that still is clearly marked as Native American. And he also picks women rather than men to portray um, <clears throat> with their shawls and their flat brimmed hats and their long straight hair, things that that uh, Euro-American women would not um, see as part of their persona in public. Um, and he paints them in an economic exchange uh, with um, their Euro-American neighbors, suggesting ongoing relationships, maybe still somewhat askance, but bringing to mind um, a very um, uh, turbulent moment uh, in the history of New England when these populations were at war with one another and killing one another. Um, and the Gloucesterites, um, Maine used to be part of Ma Massachusetts. So, so going back and forth from Maine to Gloucester was not a big deal, <laughs> except that his ancestors were, were um, uh, uh, fled Maine um, and, and the difficulties in Maine to go, go down to Gloucester, but the memory of what had gone on there was is clearly part of the way he paints certain landscape elements. Uh, there's a, a well-known um, group of hills at the, at the opening of the at, the, at the, at the mouth of the Penobscot Bay called Owl's Head, um, which he paints in the morning, he paints it at night, he paints it in storms, he paints it on beautiful calm days, he paints it from any, direction, north, south, east, and west. Three of his ancestors were killed there. Um, uh, it's clearly part of his thinking about that place. Um, and part of the book that that um, I, I, I hope is not too aggressive. Um, what I'm trying to say is the art historians who talk about these as beautiful paintings of a peaceful, tranquil, leisure um, place to spend your vacation are wrong. <laughs> um, that, that, that Lane is actually painting uh, uh, a, um, a plea to remember this, this deep history of this place. So, but that plea pushes back against uh, tranquility in a couple of ways. W one, one is that you're emphasizing his, his engagement, sometimes mournful, um, with the past, but also because it presents it as bustling and, and modern in some way, uh, which is why it's sort of striking that at, at some point in, I think in the introduction, you want to see him as an anti-modern, mm. as an anti-modernist. So can you talk a little bit about how we would, would situate uh, this painter in some story about modernity? Interesting, really interesting question. <clears throat> Yeah, I think he's he's in many ways he's painting his his moment, but he's also painting a couple of 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 works that imagine the scene before the wharfs were built up or before the wealthiest man in town has taken the prime real estate. He he eradicates them from his painting as, and and suggests that he's painting what he saw as a child. So, so he's he's bringing us back into another state of and and his his contemporaries recognize that they write little essays in the in the in the newspaper saying ah oh, this is what it looked like you know forty years ago 
uh, before the big guy in town, you know, took over this prime real estate. Um, so yeah, he has a, an, an, uh, an interest in asking us to, to, um, to think of the space as both the past and as the present. But he also paints for that richest dude in town. He's, he's, he's one of his important patrons. Um, so he's painting his ships. He's painting. Um, he's painting the most technologically sophisticated objects on the seas. You know, these clipper ships uh, at the time, and he's painting them with absolutely minute, fastidious detail about how they manage to um, uh, move at you know twenty four knots an hour. Right? I mean, these these are moving twice or three times faster than ships just ten years. Uh, or older. It's like it's like he's painting the Teslas, right? You know, you know he's he's finding you know the, the population for whom this this expresses themselves, but also gets them where they want to go, which is China and California. Uh, um, so and there does know. seem to be a real enthusiasm about the speed, but also about uh, magnitude and uh, I mean, uh, there's an incredible chapter about about fishing. Uh, and fish in one of maybe my favorite chapter, uh, um, you know where uh, where you show how in rendering some fairly singular details, we're supposed to nevertheless appreciate uh, just just sheer volume uh, and extensive networks of of of, of exchange, uh, which is why it does seem some, to me very much a, a sort of celebration of a kind of. A, a kind of modernity in the in the 1830s and 40s and so on. Thank you. Uh, but, but, but 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 yet you you want us to appreciate a nostalgia for what it has replaced. Right. So so yes, he paints fishing. He he paints um, some some folks in a ship in a turbulent sea pulling cod up into a ship, and then but the statistics make it clear that that was one of 120 there at that same moment on that same day pulling cod off of those banks um, and that they were extracting thousands and thousands of tons of fish and 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 thousands of trees and thousands of pounds of granite was all being extracted but he paints singular instances um, and yet references these really major extraction industries that um, most artists avert their eyes from completely. They just they just don't see it. Um, I'm gonna, I do want to ask one sort of maybe stereotypically historian's question, uh, uh, which is like, what kind of vision of of nation do you want us to identify with Lane? I mean, it's ocean rather than continent. It's cosmopolitan in a lot of ways, but it is sort of looking a lot at trade centered in 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 England. Um, I imagine some people in this room are thinking about the transcendentalists and wondering what to sort of sort of haunts this book in some weird ways. Uh, you're pushing against that, but um, wondering whether there's a vision of nation that is markedly different from that that we might identify with Emerson or with whoever. Uh, so uh, is is nation at all a helpful way to think about what is distinctive or Oh, you're getting to the nitty gritty here. Yeah, um, his image of the nation. I think the, the the place that I found that enacted most vigorously. I should I should mention I had the great good fortune of spending a year um, at the American Antiquarian Society and another year at the Huntington Library in Southern California to research this project, which was just fabulous. The American Antiquarian Society has all the historic newspapers. Um, that's you know if you want to. And the diaries of the people and the diaries and, yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, yeah and and prints and things like that. So I spent a long time reading newspapers. I would I would get up in the morning and I would read newspapers. I I wanted to see the world that Lane saw. I wanted to imagine, you know, Lane reading those newspapers about Indian removal and and uh, uh, and matters of of import to the nation as well as local. You know how many schooners were ready to go out to get mackerel this week, um, and one of the strongest messages I was getting was how worried they were about California. You know, 1848 is a real watershed in New Englanders' 
if, if I'm interpreting this correctly, yeah, imagining themselves as being the most, um, you know, politically uh, uh, um, astute, uh, educationally sophisticated, um, uh, um, agriculturally uh, competent folks, and suddenly their whole uh, ethos of you know, work on the farm, get your best breed of sheep, you know, get your fences tidy, you know, uh, pass it on to your sons, et cetera, et cetera, is completely destroyed by these guys, these bachelors generally going in, in, in groups off to California and coming back with their pockets full of gold. It, it, it's, it's really disruptive of their sense of, I'm not sure whether it's nation, but their sense of what it is to be an American. Uh, what it is to be uh, a, a virtuous person uh, um, and a hardworking person and an ethically engaged person and a community-oriented person. Because these were folks who bailed, right? They just said, eh, you know, I'm going to go gamble, right? Gamble. I mean, what could be more un-New England? Than and it was a significant portion of the population of Gloucester. Right, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, they were losing... Um, you know, they were losing their young men uh, uh, in, in to maritime disasters. They were losing their young men to California. They were losing their young men to the uh, um, to the Civil War. I mean, there's a sense of crisis going on. So that's a little bit different. You you were you're going in the direction of transcendentalism. Um, yeah, which yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that, that that's a whole, a whole. It's hard to write about this without. Uh, without encountering readers' expectations. Right. That, and also because so much of, so many of our, our myths of uh, antebellum New England uh, culture have been framed around that. And also the, uh, uh, the transcendentalists play a big role in the resuscitation of right. so, uh, Lane. In the, so anyway, I'll so yes, talk about I would that. say that the trans, although Ralph Waldo Emerson is in the background. Um, two of his brothers go to work for Lane's principal patron um, in Puerto Rico, where he's the consul um, and a businessman and introduces banking, for instance, and, and uh, owns a plantation. Uh, so, so these two Emerson brothers are down there with him and writing letters back, bless their hearts, those Emersons wrote every day. It's just amazing. And they kept all their letters. Um, and they're all at Harvard, so you can go and play with them there. Um, so and 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 Ralph Waldo gets involved um, in 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 the in the story personally, but I argue against the the impact of transcendentalism on Lane's paintings, partly because when we come to the middle of the twentieth century, it's that's the hook with which scholars and the market picks up Lane's work. They say what we're looking at here is painted versions of transcendentalism. That's the, that becomes the shtick um, about in the late 1960s. And suddenly these paintings come out of the barns and out of the attics um, and they go to the market and they just zoom off the, you know, again, here I am talking about money, very impolite, but yes, okay. Uh, it is a measure of value. It is a measure of understanding um, and, and um, desire, I guess, desire. Um, so that's what mid-century Americans wanted. They wanted paintings about um, an America that isn't indebted to Europe. So they're, they're looking at um, uh, native productions or what they understand to be native productions. And they find it in Lane, um, who's you know, in the very first chapter, you know, in, in the 1950s, there, he's, he's, he's presented obliquely as kind of a folk artist which is interesting. And then he becomes the mainstream artist without changing anything. <laughs> really, it's like, okay. <laughs> uh, um, so, um, yeah, so that becomes the way Lane is understood, uh, is that he's, uh, these flat water uh, images where the sky and the water echo each other, and there's a sense of stillness and calm, um, is those are the paintings that just rocket off the uh, uh, off the podiums and in, in, in the, in the sales. Um, that's a little bit about interest in form as well, uh, in, in 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 the formal features of the painting. Right, yeah. but those but those uh, um, those scholars say don't look at the details. Right. Just look at the formal quality. Just look at the horizon 
against the verticals and the diagonals of the, you know, it's like whoa that's not a diagonal that's a spar you know that you know that that's part of the rigging of a ship let's talk about it as a ship and they don't they just say don't look at the details look at the sun you know look at the you know so I, i'm saying please it's all in the details look at the details <laughs> that's that's what he was looking at and that's what his his customers were looking at his contemporaries were looking at so should we take some questions from 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 the room i mean I, a lot more to be said here but Tina? Tina? yes <laughs> Right. I, I think I should mention that, um, yes, he does paint harbors. He does paint uh, um, the, the seacoast. Um, he even paints one or two beaches, which is, of course, we're only beginning to get beach culture at this moment. People understanding the beach is something other than wasteland. You know, it's a place to go and, and look, right? Um, uh, but it's the inhabited rim along the water that he paints. He, he was disabled, I should say. He was, um, uh, when he was two years old, he became ill. And when he um, recovered, uh, he, he could only walk with crutches. So, so he was not, I mean, we could say that he had his career in the harbor um, because he wasn't like Frederick Church, able to go glomping off into the Adirondacks or something like that. Um, but he did get around. He um, he traveled by sea. He went uh, cruising through Maine, uh, the, the Maine uh, islands, um, camping out uh, with his pals. Um, he got as far south as Baltimore, um, probably got to, to Puerto Rico to, to paint one Puerto Rican image that, that um, I think uh, he almost certainly did on, on site. Um, he also, there are records of his being hoisted up on masts so he could get a prospect, things like that. So, so he wasn't, um, uh, so, so he was able to get around, but, but, he, um, but he didn't get far from where the water could take him or a, a gig. He, we have some records of his renting a, a gig so he could go by horse, you know, by, by um, cart or, or, or a little, little gig around the um, peninsula of Cape Ann. Uh, but yeah, he the water's everywhere, um, and his contemporaries were particularly interested in his depicting water. Um, that that is a magical entity that has no substance and yet is so very present and so very powerful and so very important. Uh, um, they they thought his rendering of water was top notch. Yes. Amy. Yeah. I appreciate you wanting us to pay attention to his focus on labor. Um, and you talked about his his portrayal of Native American women, but I'm wondering if he ever depicted African American labor in Gloucester or in Maine or anywhere else. A really interesting question. Uh, as I said, Gloucester um, had less than um, 8,000 people in 1850, which is sort of the, the uh, an important moment in his career and four African-American families. Oh. So this was not um, an important element in the economy uh, or the labor market of, of, of Gloucester. Still, in one of those newspapers I was looking through, I found this little one-line articles. I, you know, I, I, 
our newspapers don't do this, but in the 18th century, they would literally have an article that was one line. Okay, and this line was, Mrs. Nancy Prince has published her memoir. And I thought to myself, hmm, huh, what's that? You know, okay, so I looked her up. She was an African-American from one of these four families um, who, at almost an exact contemporary of Lane. So that's my next book. Ah. <laughs> By the way, as is the case with many of the people in this room, it's very dangerous to hand us a microphone. <laughs> but actually, I have a follow-up question which I think is about labor, and you're commenting on Lane observing the technology, the labor of his time, and it made me think about something I learned from the art historian John Berger, who said that in Picasso's work, arguably the person who dominated the 20th century in art, there are no references to the 20th century technology. Um, and then it made me curious if there are artists in the 20th or 21st century with whom you see an affinity for Lane. And, and the name I thought of is, at his very best, Thomas Hartnett, who made a great expression of the imagination. Um, I wouldn't usually put Benton in the same in the same um, breath uh, with 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 Lane, but I can see your point, and that is um, he's um, it, for those of you who, who don't know, he is a muralist, primarily a muralist, <laughs> but also there's some large canvases of his here in the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, so you can go see them. But his, his murals are about in, in large um, part um, about urban life, which includes labor, it includes um, leisure activities, it includes, it's, it's primarily figure, figurative. Um, Lane's figures are, are, are small, and the reason our eye goes to them is A, because he often puts them in a red jacket or something, um, but B, because we are, as I understand it from psychologists, we're sufficiently narcissists that we look for human figures, right? Uh, and even if they're very small, they will still draw our eye in, in any kind of tableau. Um, Benton, you know, whops you with them, right? <laughs> that they're just, you know, they're, they're huge and very, very present. Uh, much more subtle, I think, uh, in Lane. But, but um, yeah, who paints labor in the 20th century? Interesting question. It, it would be in the 30s. Or extraction. I mean. Or extraction, yeah. Yeah, not so much. I mean, artists tend to avert their eyes from many things. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I know what the answer to this question is going to be, just given what you've said. Um, uh, but I'm wondering... And I can't believe I'm asking this question, uh, but I'm wondering. You you talked about re like reading the newspapers at the um, American Antiquarian Society, but and that like raised the issue of whether or not he read the newspaper in a in a in a uh, 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 sustained way. But I'm wondering also about like other traditions of painting, like European paint. Like I, I just looking at the cover image and the, the description of his art practice, I'm thinking of like Vernet and you know what I mean? Like was, could he have seen, you know, painting of the French coastline? The, you know what I mean? Like were there European painters he might have? I'm laughing because this Why? this is the art history question. I know oh, everyone can't believe I'm asking. What are the influences? What are the influences? That's that's a hoot. Um, and my 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 answer. <laughs> it's his birthday. <laughs> he, he's, he's trying on new identities. <laughs> okay. For the next um, year, he'll be an art historian. <laughs> the, the 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 simple answer to that question is that um, he certainly never traveled to Europe. But we do know that he subscribed to a journal called the Art Journal, um, which our library has, right? Um, and in fact, they were in the stacks and it took a lot of fussing to get them put into Bancroft. 
uh, uh, because people are slicing out the engravings, right? Uh, and so he did have, it, and they're large format. I mean, it, it, it's a, it, it, it was a beautifully produced journal from the first half of the 19th century in London where um, not much on, on continental art is going on there, mostly, mostly British art, but Constable, um, Turner, you know, this is the period of the Turner gift. And so, you know, and we do know that he subscribed to the art journal because a friend says so uh, in, a, in a letter. Uh, so of course I went through the art journal to see what he had read there and to see, um, and, and so, you know, if there is an influence, it probably is Constable, right? Who's, who's painting, called the Constable's painting six footers, right? So I mean, it's like he was nowhere near that ambitious. Uh, um, but they are uh, images of daily life in the home place of, of where Constable grew up and his father owned the mill and here's the mill. And, you know, this is how, uh, uh, this is how the locks work um, to, to get the grain in and whatever else. So, so if there's, if I had to do that, yeah, I, yeah. I would. I would say. I would say constable by way of the archer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a this is really fascinating. Um, I was not thinking so much of the transcendentalists precisely, but more about his contemporary literary writers or his approximate contemporary literary writers, Melville and Hawthorne and Thoreau to some degree in terms of the representation of the transformation of the landscape through industry. So the train, the mill, well, of course, and also in this novel, there's you know, the shipping, shipping and fishing industry. So there, there seems to be more of a relationship than to the philosophy of transcendentalism. Does that, does that strike you as uh, reasonable? As, as possible. Okay, well, um... What we know about his education was uh, that there wasn't much. Um, uh, his brothers were, um, the, the, um, you know, codfish were paid so his brothers could be tutored by the local mathematician so that they could become navigators or something. He was not. Um, he was um, uh, tracked into being a shoemaker. So, um, he, you know, very, so he had a, a very minimal education. Um, and after, um, you know, at the age of 27, he just, he says, I'm going to change my name. I'm going to go to Boston. I'm going to become a lithographer. But, but as a kid, I mean, his mother was given certain allowances. She didn't have to pay taxes because she had a disabled child. So, so we know that, that, um, that he was seen as a burden and not as an economic engine and not as somebody, a, a youngster with promise. But, and so he's a late bloomer, let's say, 27. He's, he puts down his shoemaking tools and, and, and lights out for the big town. Uh, um, so um, on the other hand, when he builds his house, and, he, he, and I think this has to do with a, a patronage story, but I don't want to get into it right now. When he builds his house, he builds it with granite, which is completely outside of the local tradition. He builds it with seven gables before Hawthorne. There you go. Right? And with internal vaults in his studio. Like he goes Gothic. There's just, an, and nothing else in Gloucester is Gothic, architecturally speaking. <laughs> like it's like, whoa, what's going on? Art journal. <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course, I tracked through that, and I tracked through yeah uh, the the things that were being produced in the lithography shop that he worked in when he was when he went into Boston. Um, yeah, there are some uh, you know Gothic buildings which are, are are there, you know in in that shop's lithography production and stuff like that. So so yeah, if you really want to do the influence thing, yeah, I did that too. Uh, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we don't know what he read. We have like maybe two letters. We have no diaries. We have no account book. Uh, we have very, very little from him. Um, we, we just have his pal, this guy named Stevens, who was very enamored of his work, um, who annotated his drawings. Uh, who ordered a painting from this drawing? And who was there on that day when they had the picnic at that beach? 
the, the initials are in the right hand corner of, of you know, even the children are included. Uh, um, so, so, you know, bless be this, you know, everyone needs a Boswell, right? You know, uh, and so, so, so we do know something about the production, but a lot but we don't. I, I wonder whether that question is just about the influence of, of the authors that you mentioned, but also just how you might compare Lane's vision of, ah. of uh, industrial change. Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that for Lane. Uh, um, uh, he's definitely upbeat. I would say he's, he's saying that this landscape works. I, I think that's I would I would stop right there. And that's and that's, and that's a that work word does a lot of work for you there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did he ever display any of his paintings in Boston or in uh, New York in the way that his contemporaries did in small theaters? In small theaters, that I I can answer your question up to that last phrase. Um, he, I'm he, thinking of the very large paintings that were on display uh, that uh, Cole and others did, uh, Burstad. Were you paid to go into a theater setting? No, 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 absolutely not. I mean, we're talking about, uh, um, you know, at this moment, you know, Frederick Church is able to have one painting exhibitions and people would pay 25 cents to come in and see one uh, painting, huge paintings. Uh, um, and sell them for ten thousand dollars. Lane sold his paintings on average for two hundred. Okay, one hundred to two hundred. The most he ever sold a painting for that I have a record of is five hundred. So he, this is much smaller potatoes. But yes, he did send canvases to New York to be exhibited in the annual exhibitions, and he did send them to the Boston Athenaeum for their their annual exhibitions. But you know, altogether. I would say maybe 20 of his images were, were publicly exhibited like that. Uh, and they were actually in the American art uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, lottery. So, so, you know, some guy in Kansas got one of them. So, but. Deborah? Okay. I just, uh, you, you dangled it and I want it. Follow up on Suriname. Tell us about Suriname. Ah, the Suriname collect connection. That's fish. Um, the the major um, the major economy of Gloucester was fish, and all, and and but they were not consumed in Gloucester. In fact, most were not consumed in New England. Um, most were salted, dried, barreled, and shipped either to the um, Catholic countries of Europe. A lot went to, to, to Lisbon uh, um, for Fridays, um, but the but the major uh, their major trading partner was Suriname, and so the fish were the primary uh, protein for the slaves, um, and they were bought by the barrels um, because, um, yeah. So um, so there's a major economic link going back and forth between uh, this very distant, tropical, very different kind of place and Gloucester. Uh, um, so yeah, I, but there's a chapter on that too. <laughs> so. Thank you for sharing. I'm quite interested in the reception history of Oblane's works. And you mentioned that he, his fame actually faded like afterwards and he got important again during the Cold War. So I wonder like, the reasons behind this. Thank you. I'm not sure I caught that. The reasons that his his reputation declined? No, but the re the reason and and the reasons why it was revived during the Cold War. Oh, uh, okay. Well, the reason it declined uh, was taste changed, um, and that Gloucester was there was no art gallery in Gloucester. There was no art dealer in Gloucester. I mean, this is this is his paintings hung in the bank, and 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 one of them was a shop sign, you know, that hung outside in, in in the streets, and he painted banners and things like that for for uh, political rallies. Um, uh, so uh, he died uh, um, uh, more or less at the same time as Appomattox. There was a lot else going on in the country at the time. Uh, um, and uh, um, case changed and his, you know, nobody was buying, selling, or interested in his work. But in the middle of the 20th century, when there was this search 
for um, roots for 20th century life and, and art and literature that were native to this continent rather than imported from Europe, um, there was a, an all out search, let me put it that way, for, for such roots. And, and he came in under that um, enthusiasm. Um, that's the short answer to a long and complicated question. I think we have time for one last question. I was interested in uh, his own ability to make a living. You say he left for Boston at the age of 27, so he must have been able to predict that painting would give him an income, and then he built that house. He, did he have a patron or? Good question, and, and I'll give you the quick answer. He left at 27 to become a, um, a, a wage laborer in a lithography business. You know lithography um, oh. um making prints and 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 um musical sheets and and advertisements and things like that in a printing firm um and he was just one of the grunts uh, um but he was there for for enough years to get good facility with drawing um, the question is how did he come back to gloucester in 1848 with the money to buy property and build himself this really solid and expensive, although not very sophisticated house, um, right overlooking the harbor. Um, I hypothesize that one of the guys he's doing lithography for is uh, um, Robert Bennett Forbes, the important um, China trader, and one of the wealthiest China tra trader. And he's doing illustrations for, Lane, for, for uh, Forbes's publications uh, um, Forbes was inventing new kinds of um, rigging, new kinds of ship hulls. Um, he was the, a big proponent of propellers rather than paddle wheelers. You know, you know that, that's Forbes. Uh, um, and was the owner of um, dozens and dozens of ships. So he was a very, very wealthy guy. So I hypothesize that these little modest lithographs that are included in these publications were what um, were important to Forbes, prompted Forbes to give him the money to establish himself as a painter. So he's really moving from being a wage laborer to being a, a proprietor of a business that really counts on um, the patronage uh, of, I won't say the, the wealthy class because he was selling to the school teacher and the post office, postmaster and folks like that. And his paintings were modest. Uh, in, in their price, but he, um, uh, but I think Forbes is in the background there. The, the opium trader, if you want to. I was to about to say, we, <laughs> if I can dangle one more thing, Forbes gets us into opium. So uh, <laughs> so if that's not an inducement to uh, go out and read this book, I'm not sure what I can come up with, but uh, thank you. <laughs>